plan for tonight was a nice overview of some methods for home food preservation. And um, maybe some of you have actually taken some programming with my good colleague, Daryl Minch from RCE of Somerset County. And Daryl and I have done many presentations on um, home food preservation over the years and workshops in her, in her office. Um, she has gone on to a blissful retirement. I miss her terribly, but I am uh, picking up, trying to fill those shoes. And um, actually this was a referral for me tonight to, um, to do this presentation for you. So um, as always, uh, our uh, programs at Rutgers Cooperative Extension are um, open to residents without any uh, discrimination based on race, age, sex, gender identity, anything, all are welcome to our programs. So before we even get started talking about the home food preservation processes, I just wanna have um, a little reminder about safe handling of garden produce because that's probably what's on everybody's mind uh, at this time of year. I know it is on my mind. Uh, so safety, food safety begins at every step of handling fresh produce. So always start with clean hands and surfaces, wash your produce thoroughly under plain running water. Uh, don't uh, commingle your fresh produce with cutting boards that might be used for other things like uh, meats. Dry your produce with a clean towel or paper towel. And again, uh, some produce might need to be stored temporarily in the refrigerator, such as perishable berries or greens or herbs. So I generally use the rule, pay attention to how they're being stored in the supermarket and you'll have a tip on the best way to store them at home. So for tonight, I thought we would do a quick overview, well, not quick, but a, an overview of three, I think, of the most popular methods of preserving foods at home. So we'll cover freezing, canning in glass jars, and a little bit on dehydrating. And the reason why we're, it's good to have the overview is that not one method is necessarily the best method at every time or for every person. And it's good to know what your options are for preserving your foods. Okay, so let's start with freezing. That little button doesn't work. I have to, okay, so what are the advantages of freezing versus some of the other methods? Well, it's really simple and um, it's pretty quick compared to, for example, canning in a water bath canner or a pressure canner. And what I really like about freezing is that you can freeze small portions, you can freeze large portions. So you can really tailor the amount of food to what you have on hand or to your family's uh, meal sizes. So it's very adaptable. And that's what I really like about freezing. And many kinds of foods can be frozen. Generally, if we pay attention to proper freezing temperature and containers, uh, we can get pretty good color retention and flavor retention and also excellent retention of the nutrition in the foods. And uh, for the most part, texture is pretty good. There's some exceptions to that, some foods that just do not freeze well. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So those were the advantages. What are some of the disadvantages? Well, uh, freezing will definitely change the texture of some foods when we defrost. They may start out pretty firm, but then uh, when we actually defrost them to use them, they're going to have a much softer texture than what originally went in. Uh, that's, um, there's no way to really uh, prevent that. That's just the nature of what happens to the food during the freezing process. Uh, so that's one downside. Uh, if you have a big garden or if you're using a lot of produce from a farmer's market, um, your small you know, uh, freezer that comes with your refrigerator may not be enough space. So you may want to invest in a, a standalone freezer. And of course, you, that they are not cheap. It's even tough getting one right now because of supply chain issues. And of course, there's the cost of running them, the electricity. But um, if you are really into gardening 
and freezing, then that may be the way to go. So there's that initial investment and then the maintenance investment. And your storage space really, the bigger your freezer, the more you can store. I mean, I have two, I have a big one and a little one. So, um, you know, that's up to you. Uh, more is not necessarily better unless you are really super organized about using your frozen foods. And really at this time of year, the last bullet, anytime there's a power outage, we have to worry, unless you have a generator, we have to worry about the loss of uh, our whole freezer supply, the product. So I mentioned those changes to uh, texture. So when we freeze foods, essentially the water in foods and fruits and vegetables, we'll be mostly talking about them tonight. I mean, they're just loaded with water. They're more than 90% water. Um, so when we freeze them, we, they expand. And actually what's happening is they burst the cell walls. And that's what makes those ice crystals, in, you know, will burst the cell walls of those fruits and vegetables. And that's what actually makes them softer when they're thawed. So it's that uh, expansion and bursting of the cell walls. That's just the nature of how much water is in them. So some vegetables may not freeze so well. So the ones like lettuce and greens, like thin greens, they're just going to be a sort of a limp mess when you take them out of the freezer. Celery has a very high water content too. Uh, your very juicy tomatoes. Now you could cook, you know, there's no reason why you can't defrost them and cook them, but they're, they're really going to not have any texture. They will dissolve into a bowl of juice, essentially. And what uh, freezing is doing is slowing down, but not really destroying those enzymes. And enzymes are proteins in fruits and vegetables that cause color change and ripening and, um, deterioration. So we're slowing them down. We're not completely stopping them, but we can add another step called blanching that does a better job of stopping the enzymatic action. And we can also use for light colored vegetables, we can also use um, vitamin C, ascorbic acid to control the, the darkening that will naturally happen in like peaches and pears, for example, apples. They'll, they'll darken when they're exposed to air. So we can add um, some ascorbic acid. Some people add lemon juice, it doesn't work quite as well. So what's important about our freezer temperature? Making sure it's accurate. So our freezer temperature, it should be zero degrees or lower. And please, please, please make sure that you have a freezer thermometer. You need to know exactly what the temperature is in your freezer for long-term storage. You're gonna to need to know what happens if there is a power outage. So invest in a freezer thermometer and one for your refrigerator too. Now I get this question a lot this time of year when we've had some severe thunderstorms or God forbid we have a hurricane and we're, we're all without power for a long time. So how, how do we know, what do we do if our freezer stops working for any period of time? So the rule of thumb, if you have a full freezer, that food will be safe and frozen, mostly frozen for about 48 hours. If it's half full, you cut that time in half down to 24 hours. And that's assuming that we're not open and closing, open and closing. So you wanna keep, if you have a power failure, do not keep opening and closing your refrigerator and your freezer. I just put a note there about your refrigerator holding time. Your refrigerator, which is at 40 degrees or less, will only keep that temperature for about four hours. It's not much time. So when people call and say, I've been without power for two days, is the stuff in my refrigerator safe? I'm telling you, Absolutely not. And if your freezer, if the stuff in your freezer has been less than 48 hours, if you can still feel ice crystals in the food, or if the temperature has not exceeded 40 degrees, so basically your freezer has become a refrigerator, 
that food is still safe, but then you're going to have to cook it. You're going to have to put it into another um, refrigerator where it can be held at 40 degrees or less. So please be aware of this and don't take chances. Um, never, you cannot always taste bad food or bacteria in your food. So don't be tasting to determine if it's safe. You, you can't tell and always keep a thermometer in your freezer and refrigerator. So a couple of guidelines to make freezing go a little bit better. The colder your foods are, what we wanna do when we're freezing is we wanna mimic how commercial freezing is done as fast as possible and as cold as possible. That's what we wanna do. Uh, you know, we have great limitations at home. We, we can't flash freeze. So we want to try to, if you have um, the intention of freezing a large batch of, let's say, tomato sauce, um, you can, and you have the ability to set your freezer, your chest freezer, or your upright freezer, even lower than zero degrees. So lower it a little bit to even minus five or minus 10 degrees to get it super cold. That's what we want to do. We want to freeze the foods as fast as possible. Um, don't overload the freezer with the unfrozen food because what you're doing then is just raising the temperature inside the freezer with those warm foods. So it will take them longer to freeze. So it's good to think about freezing, you know, what will realistically freeze in about 24 hours and you wanna spread it out in your freezer, not all the warm foods together, you wanna spread them out ideally next to the coldest food so that they'll freeze fast. And once they're frozen, then you can organize them any way you want. But the process of freezing, we're aiming for quick and really cold. Okay, let's see, I think I said this, almost everything on here. Oh, keeping an inventory, so your food, your food in your freezer, you know, will not last an indefinite amount of time. It really depends on the food. There are some lists that you can check, you know, very perishable foods, delicate foods will get, eventually they will dry out. They'll get what we call freezer burn. That's really dehydration. Air has gotten in touch with the food and has basically uh, given it that brown, crusty kind of an unpalatable look. It's not unsafe. It just is not very attractive and tasty looking and you know may have a little bit of an off flavor. So think about how much you're freezing, think about how long you're gonna keep it before you use it and try to use the, the oldest foods first. So try to have a system. And, and this sounds easy, but uh, as a person who has two freezers, I will admit that things will get lost in those big freezers that I haven't thought about in, you know, many months, but you try. The container is really important when you're freezing foods. You really want to invest in um, good freezer bags that are meant to go in the freezer. So not just sandwich bags that may not be thick enough to keep the air out. You want, uh, you want plastic bags that are designed for freezing. They should say freezer bags or safe for freezing. Um, and um, packing things, here's where you think about the logistics of how you will use the food when it's taken out of the freezer. So freezing a giant blob, block of vegetables that you will not be able to break apart into reasonable servings will likely end up in waste. So think about packaging the foods in serving sizes that you will actually consume. So if you're a two people household, you know, you might want to think about servings for two or maybe three people at a time. Uh, if you have a large family, you know, you can do multiple servings or you can pack a little bit larger. But remember, we're not saving money if we are throwing away food. And if you're packing in rigid containers like on this picture um, and the food is somewhat of a liquid. So, for example, we have some kind of a. I don't know, it looks like cream corn maybe, or tomato sauce or something. You, you notice that we didn't fill all the way to the top. We wanna to leave a little bit of room, like a headspace, a half inch or an inch 
the liquids are going to expand when they're frozen. So we don't want the tops to pop off, leave a little bit of room, at least a half an inch if we have a liquid or a slurry, something like that. Solid foods are not going to expand much like this bag of green beans there, but a liquid will. And again, good quality freezer containers will maintain the quality of your food longer. That's really the, the main point here. Um, let's see. Remember cheap bags, bread bags, paper cartons, those are not gonna be impervious to air, which we need. We, need, we don't wanna get air in our uh, frozen foods. And another important point, this really applies to anything we're talking about tonight. Now the quality of the food going in is the best quality. It will never be better than going in when we freeze it, can it, or dehydrate it. So don't think that you know you can use um, you know food that is really overripe or uh, moldy. I don't. I know you wouldn't do that. But um, bruised foods, uh, fruits, things like that. The quality going in is equal to the quality coming out. So think about that too. And here's a tip, label everything so that you know, my husband's not home yet. So I'm gonna say he often doesn't label things. And you think you know what they are, but after a couple of months and they've been pushed to the back of the freezer, you may have no clue what is in that bag. So put a proper label on it. Um, in talking about some of our produce, uh, some of the easiest ways to freeze fruit is if it's small berries or small pieces like uh, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, freezing them first on the tray, so the upper right corner here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but once they're semi-frozen on a tray, then you can put them into a bag or a container like we have down here in the lower right corner. This way, the pieces don't stick together. They don't come out in one big block. Some fruits like peaches or pears, you may wanna freeze them in either a syrup, a light syrup or um, even water, but syrups maintain the texture of the fruits better. And in, um, you can get all kinds of um, recipes for different levels of sugar in your, um, in your syrups. I'll talk about resources a little bit. And we already talked about darkening, the, the issue of um, light fruits turning dark. There's some, you, you can't really control that completely. They will darken when you take them out of the freezer, but ascorbic acid or vitamin C is one way you could sprinkle it onto your, uh, your fruit before it goes into the freezer or into the solution. Um, I use fruit fresh, which is like a commercial version of that. Uh, very simple, it sprinkles out of a container. So, um, if, so if you're working with, just be aware, light fruits will darken and you may need a, um, um, an agent to control that a little bit if you're concerned about the color. Just one word about blanching. So we, we talked about those enzymes that act to really ripen and degrade naturally. This is what happens in um, you know, fruits and vegetables and other foods. So by Blanching, that's a quick plunge into boiling water for a very short period of time, a minute or two minutes, depending on the food, 30 seconds. Um, that will quickly destroy those enzymes. And then um, what we have to do is quickly cool those vegetables or fruits, usually in a nice water bath, and then we can drain them and then freeze them. So we've, we've really taken a step to uh, limit the activity of the enzymes. So there are tables that you can um, refer to that tell you how many minutes to blanch every kind of food and in what, uh, what um, piece, like if it's a large piece, if it's cut, if it's whole, whole corn cobs versus uh, cut up corn, whatever. Uh, one of the references I'll be sharing will, that has tables to show you that. We always get a lot of questions about freezing herbs. Uh, you can do it in a couple different ways. You can freeze them, uh, that tray method. So wash them, drain them, make sure they are dry, pat them dry with paper towels. 
and spread them in that single layer on a tray that you put in the freezer until they're frozen. And then you can pack them into freezer bags. Uh, that works really well for dill. If you um, happen to have like a lot of dill at one time and you wanna have it for pickling or something later, you can do that. You can also chop them and mix them with uh, water or broth or vegetable oils or even butter and freeze them in ice cube trays. This really works very well. And there's some pictures here. So up here in the left corner, that's a mixture of it's probably butter and oil. You can pop these little herb cubes into a stir fry um, or water. The one on the right looks like it's just frozen with water. You can put them into soups and stews, whatever. And here's just a tray method of uh, basil. So you can do it. It's a really nice way to preserve your herb harvest. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about, this is really the bulk of the presentation because it's a compl more complicated topic, which is canning in uh, glass jars. So just like with uh, freezing, when people start to think about canning their home produce or they buy a lot of produce from a farmer's market, um, you know, people are interested in doing it for a variety of reasons. Some people think they'll, they'll save money and, and that, again, after your initial investment, that's possible depending on where you get your produce. Lots of people in um, our area are very interested in uh, having a more sustainable lifestyle and growing their own foods. Um, there are some ways that you can manage your own personal nutrition um, needs. So uh, preparing foods maybe without salt or without so much sugar, knowing that you're not adding other additives. And it can be really fun and very enjoyable. So just like with freezing, with canning, we, we want to start with the highest quality food probably even more important in canning because we're going to be keeping these foods potentially, you know, in these jars at room temperature if they've been properly sealed for a year or even up to 18 months. And the quality at, again, at home, we, we don't have some of the high tech options that commercial canners do. We have limitations, but we definitely want to start with the best quality food going in so that we can get the best quality product coming out. And this is the time to talk about following a tested method. So what I mean by that is a method and a recipe that has actually come from an evidence-based source that we know that that process has been um, tested to make sure that if we follow all the steps, the product will be safe, but also that the product will be the best tasting It'll look the nicest. So the quality will be the best that we can possibly get it. So where we do not want to get recipes from would be randomly from the internet or from uh, blogs. Um, I'm going to show you the, the two places that we, we promote as very safe and um, evidence-based tested methods. And if you're new to canning, you definitely want to start with one of these. Actually, you want to stick with these because this is about the only uh, place that you're guaranteed that some organization has properly tested what you'll be doing at home in your kitchen. So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be preparing some particular food in advance, and then we're going to be placing it into glass canning or mason type jars that have a two piece lid system, even though there may be one piece lids used in other countries and even available here, um, the USDA and the um, National Center for Home Food Preservation, which is our primary source for methods, uh, still recommends a two-piece lid system. So it's really hard for you guys to see, but this is a um, the, the lid. This is the ring band they go together like that. That's the two-piece lid system. And we're gonna be heating that product. So heat is going to be the way that we destroy harmful microorganisms. We're going to be reaching ideally either 212 degrees, which is the temperature that water boils at, 
or in some cases, all the way up to 240 degrees Fahrenheit if we need to do that. And remember those enzymes, heat will also take care of inactivating those so we don't have to worry about them changing the color and flavor. And in this process, we're driving the air out of our jars and creating a vacuum seal. So we're heating, we're creating a vacuum, and that's what's going to allow uh, the food to be safe in those jars if we follow the processing steps. So there's a good picture of a vacuum. There's that two-piece lid system I was talking about um, here. Again, really hard to show you in my window, but I have a jar of pear jam that I made, actually pear butter, uh, and that vacuum seal is not moving. That's what we want to achieve. So it's going to hold that lid on. It's also going to pre prevent air from recontaminating our product. So we don't want any air coming from the outside and we want to make sure we remove as much of it from the inside. So there are people ask, well, what method should I follow? How do I know when to use a pressure canner? How do I know when to use a water bath canner? Are they interchangeable? And the answer is it really depends on the type of food. So we divide those foods into two main categories. Those that we call are acid foods and those that are not acid foods or um, low acid foods. So we have high acid foods and low acid foods. And depending on which food we're talking about, we'll determine which method we use. So let's look at the acid foods. Uh, and one, one point I want to make here is um, people will see the slide and they'll see that pH of less than 4.6. We are not recommending to consumers that they check pHs in their kitchens. This, this is for food science testing labs. Just by knowing, by following a safe and tested method, you will automatically be guided to the proper method. You will not be doing pH testing in your kitchens. That's the point I want to make. Some people ask, should they do that? No, no. You just need to follow the recommended method for the type of food that you will be canning. So what are the acid foods? Well, here's where we put mostly all fruits. There's a few exceptions. So tomatoes, tomatoes botanically is a fruit. Um, Tomatoes, figs, and Asian pears are considered borderline acidic, and they will need a further acidification step. And we do that with bottled lemon juice or citric acid. And you don't need to memorize how much, if, again, if you're following a tested method, it will automatically guide you to make sure you add bottled lemon juice if you're processing tomatoes, for example. Um, so generally all fruits, fermented foods. So foods that we actually intentionally create a lower pH in. So for example, sauerkraut. So we're using the natural fermentation process to lower the pH in that food. And then we will use a, a water bath canning method to process it. Or pickles. So when we're talking about making pickles, we add a large amount of acid, usually in the form of vinegar. So fruits, fermented foods, and pickles would be all in the acid food category. Now the opposite group, so the low acid foods, those above a pH of 4.6. This is where we place all other vegetables. So if you have a large garden and you're interested in canning green beans, not pickled green beans, but regular green beans, then those foods would fall under this category. They would be low acid foods. Um, basically all the other vegetables would fall here. Uh, then meats and poultry, seafood, soups, mixtures of acid and low acid foods. So good example, we use a spaghetti sauce, uh, starts with tomatoes, but as soon as we add meat or if we add peppers or eggplant, we've created a mixture and then it would fall in this low acid category. Okay, also in case any of you are big gardeners out there, 
you're not attempting to uh, judge the, ac the acidity of your tomato variety. You're just going to lump all tomatoes in the uh, proper category and they all need that acidification step. So even if you consider them a not acid tomato type, they still fall in that category. And um, here shows about how much, now why bottled lemon juice? Why can't you just go squeeze a lemon? Well, because bottled lemon juice has a standard acidity of at least 5%. And we wanna standardize, we wanna know that by adding that one tablespoon of bottled lemon juice, we will achieve a certain level of um, acidification, which we can't guarantee with a lemon or a lime or, or any other non-standard food. Okay, so why do we need to divide foods into those two groups? Because depending on which group they're in, that determines which method of processing we're going to use. And this is the most important thing to know. So that the boiling water canning, that processing type is what we will use for those acid foods. Pressure canning, is used for all those other low acid foods and those mixtures. So that's what divides the two kinds. That's what determines the two kinds of methods, the water bath canning versus pressure canning. Acid foods go in the, the water bath canning, non-acid foods and mixtures go in the pressure canning. And why is that? Because we're gonna need to get the temperature for those non-acid foods up a little bit higher to 240 degrees. Why? Because we have the risk in those low acid foods of um, botulism spores persisting because they don't grow so well in acid. They don't like that. They grow better in, in the low acid conditions. So we're creating the perfect, perfect environment for them to proliferate in this jar that has little air, but it's gonna be held at room temperature and it would be a low acid food. There's plenty of water, moisture for them. So it, we need to guarantee that they will be destroyed at least at 240 degrees. They won't be destroyed at 212 degrees. And even though botulism is rare, it still does happen. And um, CDC on their website actually documented some cases pretty recently that unfortunately were related to consumers selecting the wrong method of processing and doing, you know, just really creating an unsafe food. So important must for canning. You must properly prepare and process correctly. This, this is not the method of home food preservation that you want to experiment with. It's, um, you know, it can end up with an unsafe product. So you really do need to follow a reputable source. And what we use in uh, Cooperative Extension, uh, the USDA methods, there are, there's an excellent website and I have the website at the end of my presentation, the National Center for Home Food Preservation. It, we consider it sort of the, the Bible of home food preservation in Cooperative Extension. And uh, that's based at the University of Georgia. Now that's a government site an education site, and a lot of consumers don't know about that, but consumers do know about Ball, which is a very reputable, uh, you know, private sector uh, company that's been around for more than a hundred years. So Ball methods are very safe. Uh, we, in extension, we can't endorse Ball or any other private uh, entity because that's not what government does. But we are partners with Ball. We have a lot of cross training. They presented a lot of our national conferences, and we would be uh, quite happy if we knew consumers were going to Ball or the National Center for Home Food Preservation compared to going on the internet to any really, um, you know, unsafe site. Okay, can't say that too many times. All right, so let's look. Uh, if we were we were doing this in person, we would um, have all of this show and tell to show you, but doing it on Zoom is a little bit more challenging. But um, 
if you can see my cursor on the on the top left, that's a, like a typical water bath canning pot. Some are really large. These work really well on gas stoves because they usually have like the indentations on the bottoms. They usually come with some kind of a rack. You need some um, jar lifters. This is really handy. You're going to be dealing with a lot of very hot boiling water, funnels. Here's our jars. They come in a bunch of different sizes. Um, you may need extra pots. Oh, this pot, this, if you can see my cursor on the, on the uh, right below the bar, this canner is ideal for the, the glass top stoves. Like I have, I don't have a gas stove. I have an electric stove with a glass top and you can't use the, um, the typical canning pot because it doesn't sit flat on the burner. So you need to have a, uh, this type of a canning pot that has a very flat bottom and will make contact with the burner. And while I'm talking about this, if you do have an electric stove, check with the manufacturer, if you've never canned on it before, make sure that it is rated for canning because the burner needs to be a certain size. You can't exceed the uh, size of the burner by a certain amount when you put your pot on it and the weight of the pot is another issue. Um, so I did check with my stove and it is rated for canning. I couldn't find anything on pressure canning. This on the bottom is a pressure canner. It's a dial gauge type and it's a bigger, the older models were very heavy and may not be rated for a glass flat top stove. The newer models are much lighter and some of them say now, I did a little bit of research that they are rated for uh, electric glass top stoves. But I still would check with the manufacturer of your stove because if anything happens to your stove, you may be waiting a year to get a replacement with the supply chain issues we have. So just be aware of that. Uh, uh, there is a difference between the type of canning pot depending on your stove. Okay, so the logistics of canning, how do I describe this? So, you know, it can be a long process because frankly, the easiest part is when you finally get to the part of putting your filled jars into your, your canning pot. But usually there's several steps before that where you're preparing your product. So if you're making tomato sauce, you have to um, uh, remove the skins from the tomatoes and then you have to you know simmer them down you have to remove the seeds you have to simmer them down to a certain thickness and then you finally get to the point where you can fill your jars if you're making a jam you're going to be reducing 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 so you know you have to think about the whole process so obviously we can't go over a whole process here tonight but just be aware before you actually get to the part where you're processing in your water bath or pressure canner, you will be cleaning and um, chopping and um, heating, boiling down, thickening, all those steps, which can take a couple of hours before you even get to the processing step. Um, so you want to have everything ready. Logistics is, you know, a big deal. You need, you need to think about where you're going to put the jars when they come out of the canner. They need to be put on a... Uh, counter with uh, on top of a towel or like hot pads and they have to stay in that place for at least 12 hours you know while they are sealing they have to make sure you have enough pots and spoons and things you know so it really you have your jars have to be clean before you can do them in a dishwasher um, so think about the whole logistics process uh, before you start uh, if there's somebody that has done canning and you are a newbie, maybe watch them, work with them the first time. Um, if we were doing hands-on classes, it'd be a good idea to come to one of our classes. You know, who knows? We might be doing some in the future. But anyway, so it's a long process. And um, let's just talk a minute about some of the most important things that you'll be thinking about. So headspace, you may have seen, we talked about headspace when we were freezing. Headspace and canning is really the space between the very top lip of the jar, the rim, 
and then the top of whatever product we're pouring in. And that's just not random. That is specified by the method. So again, starting with a, with a very safe and tested method from one of those great sources, they will tell you. So for jams and jellies that are usually done in those small um, jars, the headspace is a quarter inch, for example. Uh, for fruits, tomatoes, and pickles, it's a half an inch. You, you don't need to memorize this. It will be specified in your method. But it does matter, and here's why it matters. Well, let me, let me see. I have, never mind, I'm jumping ahead. So headspace, we'll, we'll just cover, if I come to that slide again, we'll skip over. But while I'm talking about headspace, so what can happen is, if you have too much headspace, your jars might not seal. You have too much air in the jar. If you have too little headspace, your jar, your lids may not seal because things bubble out. They press on that lid while it's in the canning pot and things may bubble out. So it really does matter if you get good at it with practice, but follow the directions, follow the specifications for how much headspace because it can impact whether your jars seal and if you have too much air left in the jar, sometimes the top of your product will discolor from contact with the air. If the jar is properly sealed, it doesn't mean it's not safe, but it will not be as attractive and um, you may wanna consume those jars first. Everybody gets a jar that seals properly, but has more headspace than desired. And usually we'll say, let's just consume those first. Okay, so here we are, some more pictures of our, of our lids. It was hard during the pandemic to get some supplies, especially lids, and there were lots of counterfeit lids. We had a conference with Ball and they were really cracking down on counterfeit lids that were actually, they were failing a lot of people. A lot of people were complaining that they just didn't seal. Um, a funnel makes this a much neater job. Notice this jar is on a towel and not on a cold granite surface because that product is probably going in hot. That's a jam or something, looks like a jam. It's hot. And if this jar was sitting against a cold granite surface, you could potentially crack it. So we always put our jars on some kind of a soft absorbent surface. When you're filling your canner, we're going straight up and down not tilting the jars because we could loosen the lid straight up and down, down and up. And we're leaving plenty of space around the jars. Wait a second, my mouse is stuck. We want the water to flow all around the jars and we're gonna be having at least an inch to an inch and a half of water above the top. So that water is flowing all around. If you're canning and you're losing a lot of water, you may need to replenish it. And that's where sometimes you have to have a pot of hot, more than hot, like boiling or simmering water ready to replenish your canner. So once you take your jars out of the canner, remember I said, you're gonna put them in that safe spot in your kitchen, um, out of drafts, out of sunlight, and they're gonna stay there. And what this picture, this person is doing don't do this. So you don't want to be pressing on these lids when they come out of the canner. You don't want to touch those lids until at least 12 hours, or you can really disrupt a seal that's forming. It's very tempting. You know, you may hear the pop as some of the seals are sealing, but some you don't hear the pop and they won't, you won't be able to test them until the next day or at least 12 hours. So feel free the next day to come and press on there to make sure it doesn't pop up and down, make sure that the lid doesn't move, but don't do this, resist the temptation to do this when the jars are first out of the canner. After the, you have tested them and they have all sealed, you can take off that ring band and then you wanna store them in a cool, dry, dark place, use them within 12 to 18 months, um, if you have some that haven't sealed, refrigerate them and consume them like you would any refrigerated product within you know, a few days or a week. Don't taste any that you suspect could be 
spoiled, um, when in doubt, throw them out. But by following a tested method, hopefully you will get um, a good result. Okay, so I know that was a really quick overview of canning. Um, we have webinars on our website that can cover a lot of these topics in detail and I'll leave you with that. But just a few words about drying or dehydrating foods. Okay, so, so how does drying preserve? So we, we covered freezing. So that's cold temperature that really inhibits bacteria and microorganisms. And then we had canning, which we're using heat and um, driving out air. Well, drying essentially removes the water and most microorganisms need some water in order to proliferate. So by drying, we're actually making that and possible for them to, uh, to grow and proliferate. And we're also slowing down those enzymes again, somewhat, um, not completely, but you know, somewhat so that we won't have so, so much degradation of the product. Now, the issue with drying at home, again, we're, we're in our homes, you know, we're not in a manufacturing facility or food, um, food, preparation facility. So we have limitations. And in New Jersey, I'm going to say, in the summer, it is really not safe to dry foods outside because it's just too humid. Uh, it's not the Southwest where there's very little humi humidity at this time of year. We have a lot. And um, it, what's going to happen is that your food is going to mold before it will dry. But indoors, we need good air circulation. Um, we don't want a really hot temperature because that will cook the food. So, you know, 140 degrees, if we have, we're talking about like a dehydrator or an electric dehydrator, or even in your oven, it's a really low temperature. Um, and we're balancing, getting that moisture out again before things will mold. So it's a fine balance. What happens is if we dry too fast, so if we were drying, let's say uh, plum tomatoes um, and the outside might dry, but the inside would remain moist. And uh, we call that case hardening. So we've left too much moisture inside. Eventually that food is gonna spoil because we haven't removed all the water. So it really is important to get really thoroughly dry. Um, now, I, you know, I have, I have in my dining room right here, I have some herbs hanging in uh, brown paper bags, drying. Uh, that works very well. Um, uh, if you have air movement, it's even better. So, you know, you can hang herbs, like this picture of chili peppers. Not so much uh, in New Jersey, maybe very, very thin walled ones. I, I prefer to do those in a regular dehydrator, cut them into even pieces. But if you have a very, very dry place, maybe near your attic, it you know, potentially could work. Um, you, you can even try, I'm, I'm dehydrating some very thin herbs like chamomile right here on a tray in my dining room and keeping an eye on them. But really you have to make sure, if you have anything thick like a, a fruit or a vegetable, a dehydrator works the best. For oven drying, the issue is, can your oven get down this low to 140 or 150 degrees? And does it have air circulation? And that, not all ovens can maintain this and you're gonna end up cooking your herbs instead of just dehydrating them. But um, some ovens may have a feature that allows you to do this. And you're gonna have to check your own individual oven. Um, uh, microwave drying is not recommended because of just the unevenness of the temperature in a microwave oven. Um, okay, so the, the ideal way, if you are trying an oven drying, you need space, air circulation, and um, no overlapping of food. So you want a single layer. Now, some people will uh, shut their oven off and then keep the herbs in a hot oven 
as long as it's not hotter than 140 or 150. So not the oven's not running, but you're using the heat from a pre-existing um, oven. You could try that. This is really more foolproof, an electric dehydrator. They have multiple trays. Um, it allows you to, I mean, you could dehydrate different kinds of herbs or different kinds of foods. What's important in using one of these is following the manufacturer's recommendations. And usually you have to make the, the pieces small, thin, and uniform so that they dehydrate more quickly. Because it can take time. It can take hours and hours or even a few days to dehydrate some foods. Follow the manufacturer's guidelines if you have one of these. Okay, so here are the websites that I wanted to share with you. Um, so this is our RCE of Hunter and County. That's my website. You can always contact me with um, if you have questions. Um, here's the Center for Home Food Preservation. There are recipes, there are methods, there are lots of good tips for safe home food preservation. There's some articles about history, why we do things the way we do. It's, it's really the, our go-to site. And of course, um, um, the RCE home food preservation page is new. Here's where I have the webinars. We, last year we did eight different topics on home food preservation. So there's a standalone topic just on water bath canning and there's one on pressure canning and there's one on pickling and jams and jellies and tomatoes. So go to the RCE home food preservation page. And if you need more information, you know, if you want an in-depth webinar, they are posted there. And um, last but not least, before we go to questions, this is a complete change of topic, but I wanted to um, let you know if you have friends or maybe yourself or loved ones, family members who are struggling with prediabetes, this is a, a marketing uh, uh, plea. We will be running, my department will be running the Diabetes Prevention Program, CDC's Diabetes Prevention Program. Uh, we're starting our third group that is in, enrolling to start in late September. So if you are interested, if you know anyone who has prediabetes, we do have to screen because there are certain criteria that CDC um, requires. It's completely on Zoom. It is uh, weekly sessions for 17 weeks and then monthly meetings to maintain uh, progress. So if you are interested or know anyone who is struggling with uh, prediabetes, this is a evidence-based program and I invite you to contact me and I will give you more information. And here's my contact info. So I can take some questions. Thank you so much, Sandra, for presenting tonight. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now and then we'll do a Q&A.